Thanks, Ruben. As Ruben just said, you know, we are reading from Acts chapter 13. Great, if you could all turn there with me in your own Bibles. Um, no, I can't see your Bible, so uh, I'll hand you responsible. Jesus can see whether you have your Bible or not. But anyway, Acts chapter 13 from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, Listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifting arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when they had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I found David in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a saviour, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. As John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no. But behold, after me one is coming. The sandals of his feet are not high. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. But now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, the children, by raising Jesus. As, it, as also it is written in the second psalm, You, my son, today I have begotten you. And that as for the fact that he has raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. 
But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook of the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is the reading. Thanks, Micah, and uh, thanks for that reading, and thanks also, Reuben, for uh, your leading uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to spend a bit of time now in this, uh, the rest of the chapter of 13 of Acts, where we started last week. Uh, hopefully, as uh, the email went out this week, you managed to get one of the outlines with discussion questions, or as there's a kid sheet that just got a few extra questions and activity on, do on the back. Um, this will hopefully help you follow along if you've got it in front of you. Uh, there's also maybe a few things in there this week that might be useful for reference for later. So I'd encourage you, if you don't have it already, to maybe print that one out. Now, in, uh, in different areas of our lives, in different arenas of our lives, uh, there are people that we will look up to, people that we admire, uh, models that we seek to follow and seek to emulate. And so if you're into footy, maybe you're, you're a kid playing footy, uh, they are heroes of the game, aren't they? They're those people whose training ethic, whose skill, whose success, whose character, uh, we look up to and we admire them. Uh, maybe for musicians, if you're a musician, uh, there might be bands or singers or, or artists out there that you, you greatly admire and even who influence you in your own style. As parents, uh, there are often other parents that we know that we look up to. Uh, we aspire to be like them. We might even go to them for some advice in our own parenting. I know as, as a pastor, there have been uh, many models and examples and influences in my own life and in my own ministry, guys that I've, I've looked up to and learned a lot from. But this morning, we want to spend a bit of time uh, looking at a model or an example that we have of evangelism from God's word. And that model, that example, is Paul. Now, it's quite possible that you and I have other examples and other heroes in evangelism. And if you're at church camp uh, at South Bowen this year, it's quite possible that you came away with a couple of good models and examples and heroes out of those talks there as well. But in God's word, we get to read about the evangelistic ministry of Paul. Now, of course, we, we have to be a little careful when we use Paul as an example. Uh, Paul, of course, is an apostle. Uh, he has given a specific calling by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles. God's already told him that he'll go to Gentiles and kings and rulers and, and his own people, and, and we are not apostles. And Paul is also speaking in a very distinct, very time, uh, culture-bound place. He is speaking a timeless gospel, but he's sharing it in a specific place and time and context. And even Paul has slightly different strategies in different, to a different context in which he shares the good news. But today we're going to have a look at this ministry that he has in the town of Pisidian Antioch. Uh, Paul and Barnabas have gone here from Cyprus, uh, where we left them last week. They've made their way across the ocean to the, to the mainland. Uh, John Mark has left them and returned home, and they have made their way inland in what's modern-day Turkey to this town of Pisidian Antioch. Uh, this is one of the longest sections in Acts that we get to read about Paul being in one place. 
And it's also the very first evangelistic sermon that we have of Paul preaching. Now, it's a, it's a long passage, and we're not going to cover all of it. But what I want to do is I'm going to start by having a look at the evangelistic strategy which Paul employs here. It's a strategy that he will take with him to many other towns and places. And I'm going to pick out three features of it in particular. And then we're going to think really hard about how that strategy might apply to 21st century Australia, the context in which we are sharing this timeless gospel, this good news. All right, let's start then. Three things about this evangelistic strategy we want to notice. First one is this, is that Paul goes to people. Now, it might seem really obvious, isn't it? But, but let's notice that. Paul goes to people, and he goes to people in places where he can have a hearing. Remember last week, we, we looked at Acts chapter 13, and the start of it, we noticed very clearly that God was the one who did the sending. God sent Barnabas and Saul, Paul and Barnabas, and here we see them going. And they come here to the town, the city of Sydney and Antioch, and they do what Paul adopts as his strategy. He goes to the synagogue. Now, why does he go to the synagogue? Well, there is a theological reason there. He's called first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So it's theological, but it's also practical. Because at the synagogue, he has a place, a time, an opportunity to share to speak. It's expected of him. He's even asked here to bring something from God's word to them. Now, of course, this is not the only place where Paul shares the good news. Uh, a little later on in the chapter we read, he got kicked out, but that didn't stop him sharing the good news. In Acts chapter 18, he'll start at the synagogue, but he'll, he'll move to the place of the philosophers. Again, it's a place where it's expected that he will bring something to them. He goes to people. <clears throat> Next thing I want to notice about his strategy is that he starts with what they know. We see that in the sermon that he preaches, don't we? He starts with them on a common ground, on a common point. He knows what that connection point is, and it's the history of God's dealings with Israel. He's on familiar territory here. He, he knows this story inside out. But most importantly, so do his listeners. He's starting with what they know, where, what they grew up with. Now, in other contexts, Paul starts somewhere else. And, and a really interesting comparison and contrast is to make his sermon here and then again in Acts 18 where he speaks to the philosophers. There he starts with their gods and with what they know. Even in chapter 14, the next chapter in Lystra, we have a very brief message that he brings again, and he starts there with what they know. Now, why does he do this? Now, on one level, we could say, well, of course, he's just giving a good introduction to his gospel message. It's, he's building rapport. Just like any good sermon, hopefully has a good introduction. That's what he's doing here. But he's doing something more than that. He is tapping into their plausibility structure, their believability structure. So he's about to say something that to them is quite unbelievable, but he starts with something that is believable. Third thing we notice here about his, his strategy is that he then moves intentionally to the gospel word. He starts with the common ground, with what they have in common, but then he moves very intentionally and almost seamlessly to the gospel word. And, and he lets the word do the work. Now, if you notice his sermon, as we were reading through it, it's, it's very similar in structure to Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, again, to an Israel uh, Jewish audience. But he focuses in on Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his rising, his reigning, 
And then he announces forgiveness of sins for all those who trust in him. He does this because it is the gospel word which is the power of God. Paul Paul will say, as he writes to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It's this good news about Jesus, which is the focus, because that is the power to save. And I don't know if you picked up at the end of the chapter as we're reading through, there's all these references to the word of the Lord, how they, they received the word of the Lord, they rejoiced in the word of the Lord, And the word of the Lord continued to spread. It's the word of God which is at work. Okay, now the question we've got to ask is, well, what can we actually learn from this? Uh, On the surface, it might not appear to be an awful lot. Starting off at the local Jewish synagogue in Melbourne probably isn't the best place for you and I to start. It's probably even quite unlikely that we would get a hearing there. And if we're honest, we might come to the conclusion that in our culture, and I'm talking 21st century Australia, Geelong, Victoria, we don't really have an equivalent, at least not one that I can think of easily that we have easy access to. We don't have a context of easily sharing ideas with others. In fact, we don't have a culture that promotes this. You can try doing that on Facebook, but I would say it's not received very well and probably not even very wise. You see, we have to admit that our Australian 21st century Western post-Christian context, it's very different. It doesn't allow or promote the sharing of ideas and of worldviews. That's why we have this very long-standing saying that you never talk about religion or politics in polite company. You see, something has happened in, in Western culture which means that we have to work really hard to think about how Paul's strategy applies to us. We have developed a very clear, very distinct, what we call sacred-secular divide. You see, secular things are the realm of facts. They're safe. They're the things that can be discussed easily in public. But the sacred is private. That's for you in your own home. And there's a really clear line that we have and you are not allowed to cross it. So you can have any conversation you want with people about the weather, about the footy, about how the kids are doing at school, about house prices, and it's okay. It's safe. But don't you dare start to talk about beliefs or worldviews, or even political views, or why you do or do not recycle, because you have crossed a boundary. So personally, this is a little bit of an aside, but personally, I'm not really comfortable with street preaching or even walk-up evangelism. Now, Now, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I question whether it is wise in our context because it's not taking seriously the culture in which we live and how people and relationships and the sharing of ideas work. So what do we do then? How do we go to people? How do we go to people where they are at and to situations that we can talk? How do we tap into people's plausibility structures their believability structures. How do we move from the secular to the sacred in a way that is permissible? Now, I have to admit that where I'm going for the rest of this message is not particularly original to me. Um, Over the last couple of months or month or so, Caitlin and I, as part of her internship, have been working our way through this book here. 
Uh, it's called Evangelism in a Skeptical World, written by Sam Chan. And Sam Chan is an evangelist. He's Australian. And he's done a lot of thinking about what it means to share the gospel in our culture, in our context. And I think it's particularly helpful. And so I want to talk about four strategies. He's got six. I've narrowed them down to four. Uh, four strategies which make the most of the culture or the context in which we live to share this good news of Jesus, which takes the strategy of Paul seriously. And the first one is this, is that we need to go to people to peep their things before people will come to our things. Now, in a sense, this is straight out of Paul's playbook. We need to go to their things before they will be willing to come to our things. It's taking being sent seriously. What it means practically is that if we want people to come into our settings, our growth group, our youth group, even church with us on Sunday, even into our homes, we have to first be willing to go to their things. You see, in our culture, there is no sharing of ideas without relationship. There is no proclaiming of ideas without that pre-existing relationship. It's the only context, really, in which we can share what we think and what we feel and what we believe. And this is about taking relationships seriously. It's about showing people that we're interested and we care, and we're genuine. It's about attending those neighborhood barbecues and those functions when they're allowed again. And some of this is, is going to be very much like that. It's about accepting that offer to go for a walk with somebody. It might even be initiating that opportunity. It's taking our kids to their kids' birthday parties. And if it's allowed, if it's acceptable, hanging around with it. It's about hanging, on, hanging around in drop-off and pick-up zones before and after school. Going with that other group of parents for a coffee after the kids are dropped off. It's about accepting that invitation to after work Friday afternoon drinks or Friday night Zoom drinks as they are at the moment. If we're willing to hang out with them, then maybe they're willing to hang out with us. Now, for some of us, and maybe many of us, this is going to be a real challenge and a mindset change. Because I, my guess is that most of us, we're really ready to share the good news of Jesus. We're ready, we're waiting, we're looking for that opportunity as long as God drops it straight in our laps. But this is saying, no, that might not happen. People are not randomly asking me why I'm a Christian and what Christians believe. This says, I'm going to go. I'm going to be sent. And I'm going to get involved in the lives and the world of people who don't know Jesus yet. All right, second strategy. Uh, we have our friends become their friends. We mix our church life and circle and friendships with our non-church life and circle and friendships. Now, why would we do this? Well, there are, lot, there are lots of good reasons for it, but one of them has to do with plausibility structures. It's about creating an environment where the gospel message might appear more believable. Now, Sam Chan, in this book, he gives this wonderful illustration of this. He, he says, you know, imagine if someone tells you that the night before they were abducted by aliens, had dinner with their family in an alien spacecraft, and then were returned back to their home unharmed. What would you think? Well, you go, yeah, right. You might even think, um, you know, isolation is really getting to this person. Uh, but what if the next day, somebody else told you the same story. 
And then the day after that, your brother or your sister or a close friend told you the same thing. And more and more people are telling you about these experiences. Now, you might still not be convinced, but it starts to sound more believable, more plausible. You see, this, our friends, their friends, church friends become their friends, is about creating an environment where the gospel message might appear more believable. It may not be the big thing. It may not be the thing that turns people around. It probably won't be. But it's a part of the picture and the journey. Think about some of you, you, you young guys, young, young adult guys. I, I remember when I was a young adult, a long, long time ago, um, I felt like I lived in two very different worlds. A kind of a Christian world and Christian friends and then this non-Christian world and non-Christian friends. And I never dreamed of bringing the two together. I mean, probably my Christian friends wouldn't approve of my non-Christian friends and my non-Christian friends would be bored by my Christian friends. So I, I didn't do it. But I robbed my non-Christian friends of things, of opportunity to meet other believers who believe the same things I did. I just remained this kind of outlier freak with religious views to my non-Christian friends. There was no believability. You see, we are greatly influenced by the people that we trust, that we know who have integrity. We are more likely to believe the things that they believe when we spend time with each other. See, we tend to think of evangelism as a solo affair. It's kind of thing that we're sent out on our own to do in the wider world, but it is certainly not. It is a team effort. And I want to suggest that maybe, maybe our growth groups are a great context in which to have these conversations. Like, how can I get my non-Christian friends mixing with you guys or some of you guys? Imagine, like, once a month, this was, like, on the agenda at growth group, we had an honest conversation about how we could do this because we need each other in it. All right, third strategy that I want to talk that we want to talk about. Um, it's the strategy of coffee, dinner, gospel. This this is what we need to be thinking about when we're looking to create those opportunities. Coffee, dinner, gospel. This is about intentionally moving a relationship from the secular into the sacred, from the surface stuff to stuff that is real. Now, again, Sam Chan in this book highlights that conversations exist in three layers. Think of them like the layers of an onion. Think of them like an ogre, uh, if you're a Shrek fan, layers of an onion. The outer layer is where we talk about interests. That's the coffee layer. You go out for coffee with somebody, maybe maybe it's a beer, uh, maybe it's lunch at work, maybe it's kind of cool down after a workout together, What do you talk about? Well, you talk about interests, don't you? How's the weather? How's the footy? What did you do on the weekend? What books are you reading? The factual conversations, they're safe, they're comfortable. They won't start arguments and they're probably not going to offend anybody and they won't make anybody feel uncomfortable. That's the coffee layer. Going out for coffee with somebody, general chit chat. The second layer is where we talk about values. And this is the dinner layer. This is where we hang out, we eat food, we relax, and we become comfortable with each other. And we start to talk about things which reflect our values. So we don't just talk about what book I'm reading, but we talk about why we're enjoying that book. What is it about it that's attractive? We might ask questions about Why do you enjoy the sport? Why do you enjoy going for a run? Why did you choose this school for your kids? Why are you reading this book? By asking and answering and and talking about these things, we're starting to talk about our values. We've gone below the surface and talking about the things that are meaningful to us. Now, for some people, this might become really uncomfortable. They might shut down and we get the message. They don't want to go there. And that's okay. Maybe we just need to spend more coffees together before we try that that approach again. But then that final layer, 
going in, coffee, dinner, gospel. That final layer is where we talk about our worldview. That's the gospel layer. And it's the important move from values to why we have those values. Why do we think and feel the way that we think and feel? Now, it could take a very long time to get there. It might be many coffees and many dinners and many times hanging out. And we need to be good listeners, listening for the cues that people might be ready to go there. Start, might start by asking questions. Why do you approach environmental issues the way that you do? What do you think happens to us after we die? What do you think the purpose of our life is? Coffee, dinner, gospel. All right, fourth and final strategy. Their story, our story, God's story. Their story, our story, God's story. And this is really about unpacking that final layer, that, that gospel layer. This is a strategy for how we might get to sharing the good news. Their story, our story, God's story. It starts by us inviting them to share something of their story and listening intently and purposefully to what they say. So if somebody, somebody says to us, I'm an atheist, maybe the question is, well, well tell me. Why are you an atheist? How did you get to this place? Someone might say, I, I, we used to go to church as a family, but we don't go anymore. And maybe the question we can ask is, well, well what stopped you from going? Like, what, was, what caused you to stop going to church? People might talk about some major event in their life, and, and, and maybe we can ask the question, how did that change you? Like, what's different now because of that? And the point is to listen and then to understand. That's their story. Now, after that, it's quite natural that we might get asked about our own views on things. And even if we don't, maybe we can ask permission for that. Well, can I tell you why I am a Christian? Can, can I tell you why I still go to church? Can I tell you about an event in my life? And this is the opportunity for, for a mini testimony. It, it's their story, our story. Why are we the way that we are? What's changed? What's different? What, what has God done in our lives? And we pray and we, we, we long that this opens up an opportunity to talk about God's story. An, an opportunity to share something about the work of the Lord Jesus. It might not be the full gospel. It might not be the full gospel story. It might be a, a story from the life of Jesus. Another story from the Bible. But we're asking permission to share a story about Jesus which makes sense of our own story, which makes sense of why we are who we are and why we believe what we believe. Their story, our story, God's story. And let me wrap up. Uh, two things, two thoughts that... I've had while working on this, and maybe you've had as well. First one is this. This sounds like hard work. Yes, it is. There's no two ways around it. Most things that are worthwhile in life are hard work. It's intentional. It involves effort and thought and time and commitment. It doesn't come easy. If it came easy, we'd all be doing it already. But we're not. Not, not all of us. So it's hard work. The second one, the question we might have, well, where does God fit into all this? It sounds very like human, like me, technique, strategy. Where does God fit into this? Well, he's in it and he's over it and he's through it. One we talked about Paul a number of weeks ago and we said, you know, one of the things was his absolute belief in the sovereignty of God, absolutely true, that didn't stop him having a strategy. And it didn't stop him working hard. And it didn't stop him declaring Christ in any situation that he could. 
This is not divorce from the work of God. In fact, right at the end of this, I, I don't know if you noticed, there's this really killer verse right at the end of this passage. And it says, as many who are appointed to eternal life believed. How do people come to faith? God did it, didn't he? God was at work. God had appointed people to eternal life and they came to faith. As Paul had a strategy, as he witnessed, as he urged people to repent and believe. In the end of the day, that's the hope that we have. That's the confidence that we have that God will bring his people to eternal life as we share with them the good news about Jesus. Let's pray together, shall we? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we are really daunted uh, by this thought of how we share the good news with others. Uh, we confess, many of us, Lord, that we have not done very well at this and we've just waited for it to happen and we've not been particularly thoughtful or proactive or strategic. Um, help us, Lord God, to take our context, our culture seriously. Uh, help us to think about ways in which we can share this good news. Lord God, we pray that over the next little while, um, you'd help us to think about the people that you put in our lives uh, and where they're at and uh, how, Lord, we can go deeper with them. Lord, give us great hope and confidence, not in what we can do, but in the power of the gospel, in the power of your word, um, in your sovereign rule and reign. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to put a, uh, a song on now. Uh, it's a song which really speaks about the greatness of God and the goodness and the hope that we have uh, in this world uh, and in our sharing of the gospel. Uh, after that, we finish off with that, I'll be back on to close off and then we'll have a time where you can put your cameras on.
Well, everybody, it's been wonderful to be together again today. Um, big thanks to everybody who's been involved, both here at the ITC or in their homes. Uh, it's always a team effort. Uh, really thankful for that. Um, got an opportunity just to hang around now. Uh, put your camera on, have a chat. If you want to be part of a Zoom morning tea room, we'll set them up as quickly as we can, but let us know uh, whether you want to participate in one of them as well. I'm going to read, I'm going to finish with some verses that Reuben read a little earlier. Uh, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone, and we will see you next Sunday.